And so when I hear these stories in the U.S. that sometimes start in a similar fashion, uh, a vehicle stop, they pull you out of the car, and then it goes ugly. And so the reason why I take the time to tell that story is to say, that's a story that I had, that I don't talk about. How many other people have other similar incidents where they get treated wrongly by police? So for every George Floyd, for every Eric Garner, for every Philando Castile, there are gazillions of people who absolutely have had similar situations, but fortunately it just didn't end the way that it did for them. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's, it's critical for us to really, as you, you talk about looking at police reform, do I sit back and say, he treated me that way because I'm black? Maybe. Did he treat me that way because I was young? Maybe. Did he treat me because I was young and black? I don't know what it was. Yeah. At the end of the day, there was a, a situation where you pulled me over and you did not have to come at me like that. And if I was, if I was an ignorant person and wanted to go at, like, at him, you see, you see how quickly things can escalate. Oh, it can escalate fast. Right. Real fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to protect and serve. Yeah. That's their motto globally. Mm -hmm. To protect and serve. That doesn't sound like protection or serving anybody. No. Um, I've got similar stories. I have a story from the USA, but I'm going to park that story mm -hmm. uh, so we don't seem like we're uh, police bashing right. podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell a story that a, a police officer told me. And again, I don't know him. We just got into a conversation. And he just started talking to me about policing. He was a big guy too, physically imposing. Um, just by looking at him, you probably will obey whatever he tells you. <laughs> but this guy's talking to me. He says, hey, listen, I was working a night in Toronto. And a Canada-wide warrant came out for this guy that they told us is in Toronto. He goes, and with my bad luck, I'm the guy that runs into him. So I run into this guy. I have him cornered in like this back alley in Toronto. And I know the guy's a bad dude. Like he is going to take my head off. But I decide, you know what? I'm going to do this different. And I say to the guy, hey, listen, we can do this one of two ways. You know everybody's looking for you and they're going to be here in a few seconds. You can come peacefully with me or you can wait till everyone comes here and you know how that's going to go. Mm -hmm. And he said, the guy just surrendered, put his hand behind his back and let him handcuff him and take him in. Mm -hmm. He says, fast forward a few years, he's working a paid duty at the docks and a melee breaks out and, uh, and he gets jumped by some people. This cop gets jumped by some people at the, at the melee. Yeah. And as he's getting pummeled from behind, he can feel someone's pulling people off of him, but he knows it, he's on his own. Mm -hmm. And when he looks, it's that same guy he wow. arrested previously wow. who's now coming to his rescue mm -hmm. in this melee. Yeah. And he wow. says, you know, like, you have a choice of how you decide to do your job. Right. You will need to use necessary force sometimes. Yeah. But if someone's complying, yeah. there is no need right. for unnecessary force. Yeah. If I'm telling you, yeah, okay, you got me, you win, here are my hands, take right. me away, yeah. why are you throwing me on the floor? Yeah. Why are you uh, punching me in the head? I, I gave you what you wanted, I surrendered, right? I think a lot of these guys have, it, there's an adrenaline, an adrenaline rush, which is not something that you want. I think for me, why I can also speak to this type of a situation very um, like very delicately, but at the same time, very directly, is I've been in security. If, like Professionally, I work in security. And fortunately and unfortunately, I've had to actually make arrests myself Okay, over the time that I've been in security. And so I, I very well know. So sometimes when people, when people tell stories or when I see stories in the media and I look at the force that is used, there's a lot of times that people will look at the force and go, oh my God, the cop is being so overly, I'm like, unless you're in a situation where you know what it actually takes to put someone in restraints, it's difficult. So what might seem to someone as like an ordinary person, it might seem like that's a little bit excessive. Right. As the person applying the wrist restraints, you know that it's it's actually an adequate amount of force that you need to use. I'm not, just, I'm not talking about punching people in the face or anything like that. Oh, sure. But some, having to put someone to the floor is, and when you're in that moment, it's easy for us to say from the outside to say, oh, there's too much force or they're being extra rough. But if you're in that situation, there's a lot of times where, quite frankly, it's the, it's the, it's the right force. Yeah. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is because I think 
having having been someone who's been in a situation where I've 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 been in handcuffs, unfortunately, from police officers, and I've put handcuffs on somebody. This is not about racism all the time. I, I think obviously there definitely is a race issue, yeah. but it's police brutality. And I know we don't want to, you know, and we're not trying to sound like we're being negative against police. Let me just preface and say like, I know a lot of police officers. I have personal friends that are police officers. I know that 98% of the police officers that are out there are good, hardworking, dedicated people trying to do their job. I get yeah. that. So this is not about trying to paint them in a bad light and say that all police are negative. That's, that's not what this is about. But we have to talk about the elephant in the room, right? So there is, when it comes to using force, there is, a, there is a threshold where sometimes I think people will miss the mark between I've, this person is, is resisting to some degree and now I need to control them. But your adrenaline is through the roof, yeah. right? Yeah. Your adrenaline is through the roof and it takes a while for that adrenaline to dump. And you may be overreacting, but you don't realize you're overreacting. Oh, for sure. Um, and so the reason why I brought up the fact that I work in security is because there's always been this long kind of running joke, I think, just between police and security. And then also with the public and security. And I sit back and I go, the people look and go, oh, security guard, or some rent-a-cop, you don't know any better, you don't know your job. And I'm thinking, I don't see that many security officers ending up on the news like I see police officers. So the people that are supposed to be less trained and less professional, yeah. we have, like, we're, we're governed by relatively the same guidelines. The police have obviously more powers than security. But I'm thinking, you have that much more training, you're supposed to be that much more professional. How are you guys the ones that are losing your mind when you're dealing with people? Yeah. You're highly trained, highly skilled to do these things. So it's, it behooves me to really wonder why people, uh, why some police officers can't just get it together. So I think we need to address the, the, the race issue, but we also, as you said, need to address sort of the police reform and how the, that brotherhood, uh, a brother and yeah. sisterhood, quite frankly, of police officers band together because we've seen it with George Floyd. You've got three other officers who either know or ought to know that one of their colleagues is doing something horribly wrong yeah. and yet don't step in. For sure. I, I mean, uh, Kevin, when you think about, like I said, I've been on the sidelines for a long time for many reasons. I've got friends and family that are police. Um, and when I see some of the videos that go viral, not all of them really have the same level of like the same feel of police brutality yeah. because if i'm asking you I'm, I'm the law and i'm asking you hey uh put your hands behind your back you're under arrest yeah. if you're refusing to put your hands behind your back i have to get your hands behind your back yeah. you know once you put your hands behind your back and you're handcuffed that's the point when i start assessing the officer but until he's gotten you under control mm. he has a job to do to contain you yeah absolutely you're not allowing him to contain you, so he has to use force to contain you. Once you're contained, that's a whole different level of uh, of issues. But for the most part, like you say, most officers are doing their job the way it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. But this idea of uh, the blue wall or whatever they want to call it mm -hmm. is is just a part of human behavior. You know, uh, just yesterday in Buffalo, uh, the cops are trying to clear a crowd and arrest protesters. And they run over a man who is 75 years old. And their first instinct is a human one. Lie. That's their first instinct. Lie. Didn't happen. He tripped and fell. And of course, cameras showed they pushed him over. Right. And then they didn't help him. So, I mean, they're humans. Yeah. And they have human behavior with power, right. which can be highly volatile in a situation like we are right now in this world. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, they are humans. And humans behave, you know, incredibly ridiculous sometimes. Right. Um, but you have such a unique perspective because, yeah, you are working in security. Mm -hmm. You are encountering people all the time who are breaching the law and having to, to deal with that challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't mind if you can think of any uh, stories you can tell without disclosing mm -hmm. any facts that would identify people um, where you've encountered a person, where you have a kind of a tough decision to make, whether or not you place this person under arrest and hand him over to the police, or you cut them some slack, or you talk to them and try to reason with them. You have any stories like that you can, yeah. can think of? I'll take you back to, it was a number of years ago, 
it was up, it was in, it's obviously in Toronto and it's in it's sort of the kind of uptown part of the, the city, uh, working security at a pretty well-known building kind of in the Young and Bloor area. And you have a lot of, it's a very dynamic group of individuals up there. So you have everything from your business class to your, uh, to, to those that are less fortunate and, and, and live on the streets. And so I remember a, a situation where we had an individual who had stolen from a shopper's drug mart. Um, clearly the person was in need. Right. It was absolutely evident that they had stolen what they were accused of stealing. And so you, you run into a situation where the store owner comes and this is, laws have changed a little bit, but so take you back a number of years, the store owner comes out and says, you know, the person stole something. And so I'm having a conversation with the individual. We're able to stop him as a partner with me and myself. We stop the guy and we ask him, yo, did you steal what you have? Yeah, you know, man, I just, I need to eat. Now the store owner is like, that guy needs to be arrested. Stole my, because that's the, the store owner is, is passionate. It's their yeah. merchandise. They want that stuff back. And so we had a decision to make. It's like, here we have someone that, yes, who a lot of times like is the homeless guy who is up to no good and, and needs to be arrested and taught a lesson. And I said, if you've got the stuff on you, just give it back to me. I didn't take anything. I didn't. I said, listen, do me a favor. Give me the stuff that you've got. And I'll let you walk away. You sure, man? Just give me the stuff you have and let you walk away. So he pulled out a bunch of stuff from his pockets, put that to the side and said, look, same thing. There's, we have two options. I appreciate the fact that you're being honest. Like at the end of the day, yes, legally you could be arrested. But what, what is that going to do? It's going to tie up police resources. You're, you're going you're to go. Most times what's going to happen is the police are going to show up. They're going to write you a ticket and you'll be on your way. You're not going to go to jail. Yeah. So the fact for me to take is you, here's the thing you have to understand. When you're making an arrest, you're essentially taking away someone's liberties. And I think when people really start to understand what it means to have your liberties taken away, yeah. there's not a need to do it all the time. And so we're saying, you know, look, just give the stuff back, give it back to the store owner and we'll let you go. There's no point wasting police resources. Yeah. You obviously you can't afford it. Right. Uh, because we knew he couldn't afford it. And there was just absolutely no point. So we let him go. Yeah. And he was very appreciative. Oh, thanks, man. Oh, you know, do me a favor. Just don't come back. Yeah. <laughs> don't come back to the area. Have a good day, but beat it. And he left. You know, because you tell that story, I'm going to take this conversation in a different direction. Okay. Looking back at what happened 10 days ago mm-hmm. and that store owner deciding to call police because he believed the $20 bill that he got, $20 bill that he got from Mr. Floyd was counterfeit. Now, I don't know if that's a police call anywhere. I know in Toronto, I can't imagine the police responding to that. Um, but then it makes me think about the incident in Central Park with the dog being off leash. Again, <laughs> call to the police, 911. Uh, this man's harassing me, not because my dog's off leash, but it's spun in a different way. Yeah. You know, you think about that shopkeeper at, uh, I think it's called Cup Foods. Mm-hmm. I think knowing police are not going to respond to a guy just gave me a $20 counterfeit bill mm-hmm. adds in a little bit of flavor, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah, he gave me a $20 bill. Okay, uh, that doesn't sound like it's good enough for you. He's awfully drunk and out of control. Awfully drunk and out of control. Central Park incident, mm-hmm. an African-American man is threatening me and my dog. No mention of what the incident actually is. You know, this is a dispatch call that now goes out to an officer who is now responding to, there's a man who is out of control and awfully drunk. Mm-hmm. And now he's in a vehicle. Now, when you watch the video footage and the store employees come out to the vehicle to engage them about this alleged mm-hmm. $20 counterfeit bill, I don't see any animation in that video. I don't see anyone shouting and yelling back and forth. Mm-hmm. I don't see the store employees looking stressed out from their conversation with them. And then they walk back to the store. Mm-hmm. Where is the part about awfully drunk and out of control. 
like, like when do people actually stop and be honest with themselves and realize that you could be signing someone's death warrant when you use this language? And I believe they were aware of using that language gets the police to show up. That's what they were trying to do. Get the police to show up. Central Park person trying to get the police to show up by using that inflammatory language that now, to a certain degree, puts the officer in a different mindset responding to that call. You know, if she calls in and says, listen, I'm, I'm in Central Park. My dog is off leash, but he's beautiful. He's tame. He's cute. Everyone loves to pet him. And this guy's harassing me to put him on leash. Different response. Hey, we just got a $20 counterfeit bill. The guy won't give us back the cigarettes he bought. Okay, we'll come tomorrow. We'll take a report. Do you have any information on him? Do you have, do you have a video camera? We'll, we'll, take, we'll look at it tomorrow. So as much as we are heavily focused on the police, this is why it becomes a problem about race. It's a societal problem. Because even us, we're now able to weaponize our words to get the response we want. Right? We can get the response we want because we've weaponized our words to get that response. I think that's, and you're right, I think we're, when I say trained, we're trained almost to do that because it's, it's like the kids stomping their feet. If I want something from my parents and I ask nicely and the parent doesn't give it to me, right? The kid in the yeah. store, right? The I ideal, know what to do. The yeah. ideal situation is that kid in the store that wants that pack of gum or that toy and the parent says, you know, no, we can't, we can't, we can't get it today, another day. And the kid, oh, but I want it. And that kid just starts to stomp their feet, throw themselves on the floor because more chances than not, the parent's going to be like, I want to stop the embarrassment. So I'm just going to get what they want and keep moving. Exactly. So even, even in our infancy, we know how to sort of get our way with things. Yeah. And if it's not working, we know how to stomp our feet. And in today's world, stomping our feet is, like you said, using inflammatory language. It's changing the narrative so that I get what I want. Yes. Uh, and, it's, and you're right. I, you mentioned a very interesting thing. Is like when you think the next time you're using sort of inflammatory language, you could be signing someone's death certificate. Like you, you don't really, I don't think you really get that. And I wonder if those store employees in hindsight now think, wow. Like, look at look where this look, went. Yeah. Like if I had just said this, what else what, what, what would have transpired instead of yeah. him being being killed? Um, and I'm not trying to put the death on, on, on no, them no, no, in no, any no. means. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Uh, yeah, either. I'm just trying I'm to highlight it, how it's, we all have a role to play in this. We all right. can, can impact the results of right. what happens next. Right. But then you think, but why is it okay? Why is it that we think it's okay to sort of adjust the story so that we get what we want. Like you're right. Why can't we just tell the truth? Because sometimes, unfortunately for people, the, the truth or the, the nice way doesn't get the result and people want results. And we're in a very results oriented society where, and again, when something is, is, is personal to someone, they will do whatever they can to get their way, yes. especially if they really feel embarrassed or mistreated by somebody else. Like, the person feeling like she's being harassed by, you know, this, this guy asking for the dog to be put back on the leash. It's a personal thing. It's, oh, it's my freedom. You're telling me what I can do. No, I'm going to make you, you make you pay. Yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah. But it is the, that is the mindset. I'm going to make you pay. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm going to get what I want. And it is, you're right. It is like a tantrum in child right. to a certain degree yeah. when we behave that way because we, we know what we're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see that in regular life. Um, and anyone who thinks that uh, police brutality is not real, not in Canada, not here, not anywhere, again, they're humans. Um, do you have an older brother? He dominates the younger brother. That's human behavior, right? Yeah. That's just how it works. Mm-hmm. You go to school, you're in high school, the big kid generally dominates the other kids. Right. That's how it works. Everyone who has power wants to exert that power over everyone else. Right. And we just have to make sure that when you have the kind of power that police have, that there's consequences mm-hmm. when you overreach. Yeah. It cannot just be like uh, put under the rug and you know, it didn't happen or slap on the wrist. No, they have to, they have to be forceful mm-hmm. with their decisions. And I have to commend uh, the uh, Minneapolis police chief. I can't believe he fired those guys in 24 hours. That's never happened before.